I work in the Institute for the History of Science and Technology, Russian Academy of Science. Uh, comparing to other institutions of Russian Academy, we are not big institution. We have two parts. Uh, the main part is in Moscow, and uh, we are about 30 person in St. Petersburg. Uh, we published, I mean, we, Moscow and St. Petersburg, publish few journals in history and sociology of science and technology and two of them accept papers also in English and UC Packer once published a paper in sociology of science and technology and um, uh, twice a year we make annual conferences one in Moscow it's usually April and second uh, in St. Petersburg it's usually November or October. So if someone needs a reason to visit St. Petersburg, please apply. <laughs> um, I made my master's degree in St. Petersburg State University in plant ecology, but immediately after the university, I migrated from botany to history of botany because it, at some point I realize that I lo love books about plants more than plants themselves, sorry, Gary. <laughs> and um, my PhD was in history of uh, plant ecology in Russian Empire. And uh, I, I made it in 2012, and about the same time I started to flirt with environmental history, and this turned out to be my second big love after history of science, probably it's as big as my love for history of science. Um, here in Finland, uh, it was 2011, a uh, uh, conference European of European Society of Environmental History. I met Tomasz Samoylik, and in a few years, he persuaded me to join him in studying history of Vilayaja uh, forest and uh, in the long 19th century Vilayaja uh, forest was inside Russian Empire that's why he needed someone from St. Petersburg because the, the main archives of Russian Empire is in St. Petersburg it's a huge archive and I, I love to work there um, so I'm involved in this project about five years and actually as I said last summer I, I already lost the hope that this project will end ever. <laughs> <laughs> so the title of the book is Nature and Culture in Belavieja Forest in the 19th century. It will be, it's going to be published this April in Springa in a uh, series Environmental History. Um, we are four co authors. Uh, first co author is Tomasz Samoylik, and uh, he's not just historian, he's also author of comic books. And some of those comics books are translated in, into English and other languages. So. Those of you who have kids, <laughs> uh, they are mostly about nature and some of about history of the Lavezha forest. So, uh, second author is me. The third author is Piotr Dostevich. He works in the National Museum of Natural Hi History in Paris. And uh, fourth guy is Ian Rotterham from Sheffield University. Um, Tomasz is definitely a main guy who formulates at least half of our research questions and uh, he uh, often uh, makes uh, the, the first drafts. Uh, my main task was and is uh, to seek for Russian sources, to give the perspective from Russian side and also from the side of history of science. Uh, Piotr Dashkevich's task was to seek and is uh, for Polish and French sources. And Ian Rotterham 
we've had to give a kind of pan-European perspective and also Polish the language. Uh, so, Belavezhe Forest, it's, it's the map, it's here the, the black dot. Uh, now it's located, um, it's divided between Poland and Belarus. Um, it's the only forest in the European lowlands which never was entirely cut and its soil was never plowed uh, up except small patches, of course. Uh, it's vegetation established after the last glaciation and that's why this site is unique. Um, this landscape persisted until modern times with hundreds and thousands of animals and plants and species and fungi. And uh, above all, it is famous because of European bison. Between mid 18 and the early 20th century, Belaveja forest was the last refugium of the lowland European bison. Um, then I will tell you a bit about our sources, about structure of the book, and then I will give, try to give you short comments on chapters, and at some point we'll, you will stop me, because I didn't mark the time, and you, you understand well that I could talk as long as you allowed me to talk about this book. Uh, so... Uh, um, this region became a part of European uh, Russian Empire after the third partition of Poland, and that's why, uh, as I said, Tomasz needed a Russian co-author. Um, and it ends after um, the beginning of World War One. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of publications devoted to the history of Belaveja forest in the long 19th century, but only a small part of them was written by professional historians. Some of those books, uh, your library has this huge book, and this is how it looks, it's this big and heavy, like, a, like three kilo or something. It's lavishly illustrated. Um, it make on the basis of, of a lot of um, archival documents, but Kartsev was uh, an official. He was a bureaucrat. He was not a historian. So he never gives an exact citation, exact reference. So uh, one of the key tasks for our study was the search for reliable documents sources and we believe that we have achieved significant success in this regard discovered a huge number of documents in Belaveja on Belaveja in international archives but mostly in Russian and in Russia and Belarusian so this is the list of uh, archival archives but probably it's not as interesting for you because no one is working on history of uh, Russian empires. I just uh, the main, of course, is Russian state historical archive, and second, um, for importance, is a National Archive on, of the Republic of Belarus in Grodno. Uh, unfortunately, both of those archives lost a lot of documents during revolution during two world wars so uh, actually uh, we have a good bunch of uh, documents only for our last period and for all that up to the uh, 80 90s it's piece of here piece of there and black spot there so uh, we still hope to find more documents, for example, in Vilnius. Um, so other archives, um, important archive was state uh, state archive of Russian 
Federation, uh, Archive of Academy of Science, and a few archives in Poland, France, and Lithuania. So, structure and periods. We have long and heated discussion how this book should be organized. And uh, we uh, um, made a chap one chapter, one period. And every chapter discuss four topics, historical background, environmental impact, cultural heritage, and works of naturalists and travelers. And um, two first chapters are introductions and sources. Uh, chapter three is devoted to the royal period, a kind of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It was written by Tomasz and Piotr, so I do not, uh, it's not my part, I, I did not make probably anything in this chapter. And uh, chapter four is a beginning of imperial period. Uh, so uh, I, I miss the point. Um, we we uh, made our periods based basing on the governmental agency that administrating the forest. Uh, it's it's partly it's because of our sources because Russian historical archive has documents for uh, governmental agencies. It's the most most part of the documents are from government. But of course, we paid a lot of attention to local uh, peasant, to the tradition in forest use, use in, to the conflicts with the administrations, and especially the later topic, uh, conflicts between local administration and local peasant. Uh, as, as historian, you know that where all our documents come from, they come from conflicts. When you have a lot of conflicts, you have a lot of documents. And when everything is nice, there is no papers, no reason to produce any paper. So uh, chapter four is uh, right after um, the third partition of Poland. Uh, till 1837. Uh, uh, most part of this period, uh, Bilaveja forest was subordinated to the Ministry of Finance. And in uh, 1837, a new Ministry of State Domain was organized and uh, all state property, including state for, uh, forest, uh, fall under its rule. So um, in this moment, uh, um, we decide to, to make a line. Because, of course, for local peasant, it did not change a lot. But for our documents, it changed. Uh, next period, um, in next period, uh, Villaveja Forest still uh, was subordinated to the Ministry of State Domains. But uh, you know that uh, great reform periods, uh, 1960 changed a lot in peasant life. In, uh, and since most of our peasant was state peasant, so it, it, it made great shift. And another reason to make um, 1860 as a border is um, first Tsar hunt in in Bilaveja forest. And the last one, uh, uh, the last period is Tsar private hunting ground. And it was a time when Bilaveja forest was subordinated um, to mini Ministry of Imperial Court and it was hunting game resort. Uh, the last chapter is devoted uh, to German occupation and its consequences. So now I'm starting to show you nice pictures. So as I said, I do not know much about um, uh, 
about uh, 18th century, it, it was Thomas work and he published a good bunch of papers and books and most of those books are in open access so you could download this book with nice pictures and, and enjoy it. Uh, um, his um, PhD was made in, on environmental history of the Ladeja forest, mostly about uh, connection between traditional utilizations and unintentional conservation me uh, measures during a uh, time of Lithuanian Grand Dukes and Polish Kings. So um, in up to the mid 18th century, uh, there was some other population of um, of European bisons, most most of them were in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So in Western Europe, in that time, um, European bison was quite an exotic animal, and this is one of the first depiction, and it's far from the truth. This and uh, most probably the the painter never never saw a bison. <laughs> Um, so uh, what happened else, there was a guy uh, who came from France, uh, it was invited by um, Polish King Stanislav, August Panitowski, and this uh, Jean Gilbert uh, worked uh, quite a few years in Grodno, he made the a medical school, created botanical garden, and also he spent um, uh, quite a time in Belavieja forest, and actually he made a few experiments on um, bison. Uh, some of them are quite strange, and results are strange, but nevertheless, this is the guy who made first uh, scientific experiments on, on bison. So chapter four is uh, 40 years of uh, imperial rule. Uh, mm, this is probably the first Russian depiction of bison. Also, it's it's look like a hairy cool, not nothing bison. And um, uh, after the third partition of Poland, uh, Belavieja forest was incorporated into uh, Russian Empire to become the property of state treasury, as well as most of other pieces of Polish king uh, domains. Um, the, administrative of, uh, the administrative system of forest protection uh, col partly collapsed, mostly in relation to bison protection and especially the winter feeding. However, in 1802, Alexander II uh, reinstated all the former uh, protection of European bison in the forest. It was made to protect uh, the last population of rare beasts. And I would like you to pay attention to these words. Documents of the first three decades of the 19th century never refer to the species just as European bison. It's always uh, the beast that call a European bison. And often documents also say who dwelt only in Belavieja forest. Uh, what happened to uh, the forest itself immediately after the third partition? Uh, one of the district was given to Piotr Rumiantsev, a favorite of uh, Catherine II. And soon this part of forest was sold and clear cut. Uh, it left a triangular. Here, this is after uh, this uh, piece was cut. Um, but in fact, it's the only serious change that happened to the forest during the first 40 years of Russian management. 
in accordance with the new trends in um, in the management of state forest, uh, imperial government and provision, uh, provincial administration sought ways to improve the forestry management on scientific or rational principles. Uh, but it encountered several problems, and uh, one of the problems was a lack of qualified personnel. It's happened uh, in, in most other countries as well, in Finland, in um, Kingdom of Poland, and of course in Russia. The second was the need to protect bison. Definitely it's hard to build the profit profitable enterprise when you have to protect wilderness. And the third reason was constant changing. So every few years something happened, including Napoleonic invasion to Russia and including a November uprising um, of the, oh, it's also called Polish-Russian war. And it, it hit uh, Belavezha forest as well. Uh, in addition, every few years, the governmental agencies and the local administration tried to make new improvements in forest management. And before they, those new improvements started to work, they changed their idea how, man, how the forest should be managed, and they like make full term. And this is this is very, uh, very true for the whole 19th century. They, they take the decision and then they change everything. Um, so this is a few nice depictions. Uh, some of them were published. Some of them are in in the Polish archives. Uh, Baron von Brinkin was um, the head of the forestry management in, in Polish kingdom. And th there were quite a few famous travelers who attend Belavezha forest. And some of them um, attended with some more or less administrative, uh, some of them with scientific purpose. And um, when, uh, when uh, Brinken traveled to Belavezha, he took with him Jakub Sokolovsky, and he left for us such nice pictures of Belavezha forest and bison, which is wild and dangerous. Um, um, when uh, Alexander the uh, first prohibits the hunt to um, to bison, it brings some problems to zoologists who wanted to have a skeleton or a stuffed bison. So it was a, a discussion. And um, at first, Alexander was quite stubborn and did not allow to hunt bison for a zoological cabinet uh, to zoological museums. Um, but uh, Vilnius University persuaded uh, Alexander to give um, the right to hunt bison from time to time. So first bison for museums, especially for museum, was killed in 1821. And this one, one was killed uh, for Warsaw Zoological Cabinet. And um, when Nicholas the Frost became a tsar, he was quite generous, and many uh, zoological um, museums uh, got uh, bison, and they uh, they was like a main uh, things to uh, main thing to attract people in in those uh, exhibitions. So. Uh, is this uh, um, uh, this old um, bones are still important and still used by uh, by zoologists, by geneticists to make analysis and make nice pictures about how 
European bison houses species uh, connected to other species and uh, which is uh, to, to American bison and to uh, extinct species. So it's not just history, not just exhibition, it's also very um, sophisticated and very uh, modern science. So uh, another topic uh, which uh, we discuss and um, I kill a lot of time to find the documents but it, it was fun, it, it was my favorite part to seek for documents on uh, bison population and uh, measures to protect and feed bison. So uh, this line is amount of bison and these data were more or less available. Uh, this gray uh, data is um, amount of uh, winter feeding. This was uh, published in, in those cards of book. So, uh, but our new part is here. Um, and also we find a, a lot of notes how bison should be protected from predators. And uh, this part is very high number. Always seems to be for me very, very dubious. And uh, some some zoologist was sure that it's, it's it's okay for this like almost two thousand, and this was number when when uh, Belaveja forest became Russian, and this is the number when um, Belaveja forest became a uh, hunting ground, and you see this is huge amount of hay and other feed that was so uh, in my opinion this is totally fake numbers and i found some documents that uh, imply that it's it's a kind of fake number and the best Paper document I found here is um, it was um, obligatory to uh, forestry manager, forestry specialist to count those bison and guards should count those bison every winter. And it was, I think, 1823 when they sent number to uh, provincial administration. And provincial administration said, today the number is um, less than it was in last year. Please, next time, count better, or you will be punished. And starting from this year, you see, the number is growing. And I didn't know what they make them to to stop this process but when the amount reached 2000 they, they stopped at least which year it was uh this document was 19 uh, uh 1823 and it stopped like um 1858 or 57 i should check mm -hmm. okay. and uh, tsar came uh, for the first half so it was like two or three years before the hunt, but in, in that moment, hunt was not planned yet. So the, the, the whole hunt was organized like in, in two months. It, it was not like a long-term policy. Oh, in two years, survey would come, we should uh, somehow make this uh, data and reality somehow to meet. So, um, there are some ideas that there were um, episodes here, but I do not see any any proofs that. And from the point of view of ecologists, it's just pointless. Like 
they, they could not survive in, in such a such population could not survive in, in forest. Some some details that does not fit very well in, in every chapters and it it devoted either to some person, either to some interesting species or group of species, and uh, to some tradition. And a couple of uh, boxes is devoted to mushrooms, which is patient to my small mycological <laughs> past. <laughs> and uh, one of the forestry specialists who work in, in um, Grodna province in the mid uh, 18th, 19th century, uh, he left a manuscript and in this manuscript, he also talked about mushrooms. And he, he described a huge uh, mushroom, which is in Poland, uh, in Polish, Plestinachnik Oruch. Uh, most probably it's Parasis Kryuska. But uh, when my co authors um, address to this, uh, to this, uh, fungi that they say this is heterobasidium anosum and I said what <laughs> and I was able to explain them that heterobasidium anosum is anything but not a mushroom you cannot eat heterobasidium anosum <laughs> um, so uh, we have quite uh, each chapter have like three or four of these uh, these boxes. Uh, one of them is, for example, about brown bears. Two of them are devoted to forestry specialist, and uh, so next period was um, um, when when the new. Uh, Ministry was created. They at the last has resources to introduce uh, rational forestry, uh, but mostly they manage only to divide forest on rectangular uh, compartments, and um, the uh, forestry plan to use forest with clear cuts was actually it was proposed and it was even uh, get an approval in St. Petersburg uh, but uh, then uh, forestry department decides that uh, the forest is full of uh, damaged trees uh, damaged by this kind of um, traditional kind of use when a peasant chop some wood to to get um, wood to 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 light the house or to make fire um, and uh, forestry department decide to get rid of these big trees before they would be damaged and this um, um, postponed the introduction of clear cuts which is the, the introduction of clear cuts is bad for a forest environment which because it's it's in, it's a great impact for forest and uh, when um, it's only the biggest tree removed from forest it's it's not such a big impact for forest so and um, in uh, in the next period uh, Alexander II decides that forest again sh should not be commercially used or used only in, in small um, small share of the forest should be used is so it, it again um, postponed the the introduction of, of modern uh, technological forestry use which is uh, so, uh, first Tsar Hunt in, in Belavezhia was a big, uh, uh, like a mils milestone, and 
it, it changed a lot at, and it bring uh, some like modern um, hunting management uh, stuff to, to Bela Veja. There was a uh, rec um, created game reserved, so enclosure with um, a small bison herd and also they, they bring a red deer. Red deer was exterminated uh, in, uh, in the forest in the mid, it was in the 17th or in the 18th century and in the mid 19th century it was re introduced in the forest and um, Alexander the second came to forest only once but his brothers and uncles came quite often so it, it's it's gay and attention from Tsar family and by 1888 uh, Ministry of Imperial Court uh, decided to to buy the forest to to private side um, to private side um, property, and uh, what happened also in, in this period, uh, one of the um, measures to introduce a proper rational game management was to get rid of. Um, uh, of uh, uh, brown bear, of wolves, and from lynx. Uh, so brown bear was exterminated, and uh, wolves and uh, the population of wolves and lynx was uh, seriously lowered. Uh, of course, uh, uh, forestry specialists believed that it's it's very dangerous for for bison, but of, of course only like probably two or three uh, bison were killed by by brown bears and probably um, like five bison, mostly calves were were killed by wolves every year. Um, so we publish a paper about brown bear extermination and attempt to reintroduce uh, brown bear back to Bilavija. By the way, this this summer brown bear was uh, visited uh, Bilavija forest again, and everyone was totally happy that probably they will come. They by, by, by themselves. Um, so first thing to, to do in uh, in Bela Veja, uh, when, when it became side property was to build uh, a palace and to create better condition um, to, to hunt. So they bring much more deers they also bring fallow deers and they started to bring uh, um, raw deers from like also from Siberia not just from Europe but from like from Omsk region and from Sumerietia so it's it's totally not natural of course and now now it, they, they have like mixture and uh, of because uh, the, the new administrative system um, get a basement for a lot of conflicts with peasant, uh, this local peasant from one point of view, they, they gave them jobs uh, and sometimes well-paid jobs, but from the other side, they um, abandoned some traditional forest use. So it's it's hard to say if he, uh, say it if if the uh, tsar hunt was good uh, for, for local population or, or bad, um, but it was important factor for twenty five years and it left a lot of a uh, lot of documents and um, like bring some civilization in the place and 
a lot of um, artists came and also 1906, 1908 uh, there was a uh, the expedition uh, to study European bison uh, work there. So it was a lot of activity and it's a lot of documents and we did, did not finish with those um, stuff and we will continue. So it's not a, the end of the story. And uh, peasants, of course, were not as happy of to have such a neighbors as bison because some of them behave bad and some of them come into into fields and some of them when the, the um, uh, boots when they live alone they have very bad behavior and they, they could cause conflict just just because he they can <laughs> and is so um, the First World War bring a lot of destruction. European bison was exterminated by in 1919. Uh, um, most of them were killed uh, between 1915 and uh, 1980 when the German troops were there. And the rest of them were killed by um, local people who came back to their places and they have nothing to eat and they have somehow to survive. So uh, the last bison, it's believed that he, she was killed by poacher and even the name of this poacher is some kind of nonsense. But of course, we shouldn't blame the peasant who killed the last bison. It was uh, First World War. Uh, a few dozen of bison survived in zoos and in game reserve, and their population was restored. And now it looks like quite optimistic. And by now, it's like seven and a half thousand. Mm -hmm. And like two thirds of them are free living or kind of free living because they get uh, winter feeding. And so, uh, there was a huge, massive um, uh, forest exploitation, but we should also remember that during. Uh, Polish Republic, it also was massive forest exploitation and then during Soviet uh, short period between 1939 and 34, it was massive exploitation by Soviet and in post-Soviet time we also have massive exploitation of forest and sometimes it, uh, it more active on the Polish side and sometimes more active on the Belarusian side, but still forest is surviving and we hope to, <coughs> to survive.